Today I'm trying to fix this faulty PS3 FAT power supply with the help of a working one. Hello the internet and welcome to my channel. Today I've got here on the bench two PlayStation 3 FAT power supplies. These are fairly simple power supplies, they only have two outputs. Uh, one is the 5 volt standby, which is always output the moment you apply power to the power supply. And you have 12 volts, which is um, basically only starting whenever you basically push the on off button on the PlayStation. Now, before I move any further, I need to give you a big, big, big disclaimer here. Switching mode power supplies are incredibly dangerous, so please do not work on a switching mode power supply or any power supplies in general if you don't know what you're, what you're doing. Um, I would say don't work on switching mode power supplies at all. It's really not worth. Do you know what I'm doing? I'm not sure, but I take my responsibility. I'm being extremely careful while working on power supplies. I have um, an isolation transformer and I'm taking all the possible precautions. There are lethal voltages higher than mains voltages inside a switching mode power supply. So please do not work on a switching mode power supplies. If you ever decided to do it, it is done at your own risk. That being said, let's move on. Uh, you can see I put a, a little tape here. That's the faulty power supplies. That's the good power supply. Now, as I said, these power supplies, they will output five volts as soon as there's uh, power basically applied. This is the, the header going to the PlayStation. By shorting pin number one and five, basically the power supply, the rest of the power supply switches on, and then you have 12 volts output, which basically powers up the, the CPU, GPU, all the big components on a, on a PlayStation 3. The faulty power supply will power five volts. When I try to switch it on, I can hear a click but there's no 12 volt outputs. First thing I want to see, want to do with you, I want to show you how this works and what's the behavior of the faulty power supply. This is the working power supply. The way it is connected, it is connected to mains voltage here, which is currently not plugged in. Through these uh, four millimeters banana connectors, you have the, I have the 12 volts output, which is going to my multimeter, which is set to DC voltage. As I said, the moment I apply mains voltage to this board, I will have 5 volts DC uh, on this wide connector. By shorting pin number 1 with pin number 5, which I'm going to do with this little temporary rocket switch here, actually it's a push button, I will basically activate the 12 volt output and you will see 12 volts on the multimeter. I'm giving it power in a second, so 3, 2, 1, go. So we got power to the power supply but it's switched off. So if I switch it on now, you will hear a click and you should see 12 volts on the multimeter. And off. And this is working totally fine. Please remember that now probably the capacitors on the power supply are still charged. So you, you can measure them with the multimeter. I have a small tool here. It's an oven light bulb connected to two wires and I can usually discharge the capacitors by just uh, shorting them. Let me see if, uh, I don't know if they're still charged, but if they are, you should see a light. Yeah. And here we got the faulty power supply, same setup. You will hear the relay clicking, but there won't be any output. I've got mains now to the power supply and I'm gonna switch this on here. You can see that there is a little something happening, but not really, not, not 12 volts. Now, I'm not an expert on switching mode power supplies, but I think I know just the basics. So usually what happens is you have main voltage coming in for, through this connector. You have some, a little bit of filtering, some, some coils here. What happens then, there's a, there's a bridge rectifier, it's behind this, this heatsink, which rectifies the main power, the main voltage, to DC, I think it's about 400 volts. That's probably why these capacitors are rated 420 volts here. What happens next? This voltage reaches the capacitors. The capacitor will charge and, and, and keep a, a reservoir of power for the next step. The next step is basically the switching. 
you find some transistors here, and I believe these are MOSFET transistors. The way they work is there's a switching controller chip somewhere on the board. The chip is basically sending a switched signal, a square wave. This transistor is basically switch the power coming from the capacitor's bank through this transformer. This transformer is basically switched on and off, on and off, on and off very fast. And uh, the secondary will obviously output a switched output. The switched output is then rectified and smoothened by capacitors and everything. And here is you got the rated DC output. I may be mistaken. I think the advantage of switching mode power supplies compared to linear power supplies where you have a massive big transformer is the size. By using this switching on and off, so basically you're not sending 400 volts to this transformer or uh, constantly all the time you can use much smaller components hence having i think this is a 400 watts power supply in a very small compact uh, form factor what i've shown you here that's for the 12 volts for the 5 volts standby uh, i believe that this integrated circuit here is actually the 5 volts standby chip uh, the way it works uh, believe it or not this is getting I think this is getting either main voltage or, or the rectified 400 volts directly into this chip. It's a bit, it feels a bit weird, but it's how it works. And this is basically an integrated controller, switching controller, which I believe it's using in this case. I, I don't have schematics, so I'm totally guessing here. I think this is the 5 volt transformer. So again, same principle, but uh, all the transistors, all the MOSFETs, and the controller are integrated into this chip here, which is controlling this power supply, which eventually delivers the five volts out of this control of this connector. Now, off camera, I've been um, basically, first of all, comparing the two power supplies. I have a good one, I have a bad one. Um, usually the easy fault on a switching mode power supply, you have a, a blown component. So I was looking for blown component, clearly damaged components, uh, then you start looking at transistors because obviously they are dealing with high voltage so they usually are prone to failure and uh, but i couldn't find anything to be honest i was a bit stuck to be honest because again it was a bit disappointing that there was no obvious cause for the, the failure so then i thought you know there's not much i can do on these things number one i don't have schematics number two you know i'm not probably skilled enough to dig into everything i, I barely understand what happens with these things i, I don't know in depth and i uh, i totally understand my limits so the next step to be honest was to uh, do some probing around uh, it wouldn't be probably even safe to do this on camera but basically that's the uh, bridge rectifier and i confirmed that you have about 400 volts out of it so we definitely have voltage coming arriving to the capacitors but there's no voltage coming out of this transformer and i couldn't really see anything anything coming into the transformer itself so the next step was to find the switching ic basically the the chip which is looking which is sending the square wave to the transistor so they start switching on and off on and off and i found that this little IC here, which is labeled CX48038A, uh, it's a Sony part, so unfortunately there's not much available on the internet, but I found uh, something for the P version, which maybe is just a different revision. And, uh, and this looks like it's the switching IC. So basically I started looking into that one, and this chip here basically has a, has a, a switched output. It's, it's as simple as that. The switched output then is, con is connected to the transistor transistors and these transistors start switching the power. So I, I would like to show you what I found on this chip which I feel could be our problem. Here's the chip in question. I couldn't really find much on the internet. There's uh, some sort of a data sheet. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a data sheet. Probably someone reverse engineered the chip by just probing it. So what I'd like to show you are these uh, out one and out two pins, pins number seven and ten. This is where the basically output, uh, which is the, the switched signal, the, how is it called? The square wave is basically output from the chip and it is going to the transistors. So let me plug something on pin number seven. Should be this one. 
Now, you may notice that I'm not using a standard oscilloscope probe on this one. I'm using uh, this Mixig DP113. Uh, this is a um, differential probe. Uh, the problem with probing power supplies is when you're using a standard oscilloscope probe, the, uh, the ground lead is actually connected to ground, to mains ground. Uh, the problem with power supplies like this is usually ground could actually, well, the negative of a circuit could actually be at a potential. It could actually be shorting several hundreds volts to ground, uh, destroying your oscilloscope potentially, most likely maybe hurting yourself or most likely damaging the switching mode power supply. So it's really not good to use one of these probes on this power supply. To turn an oscilloscope into basically a multimeter where, you know, it doesn't really matter where you put the the negative lead, uh, you need a differential probe. The differential probe is basically measuring the difference between the two conductors. So it doesn't really matter. You can plug them wherever you want. The oscilloscope will always showing the, dis the difference between the two cables, regardless of where they are connected. These differential probes they usually go up to several thousands wo uh, volts. Yeah, the maximum input is 1300 volts. So let me plug my black probe to what I found is the, the ground reference for the circuit and I'll plug the red one onto my little clip here and I make sure with the microscope that nothing is being shorted. The, this uh, flexible leads are pretty good. Now I'm going to, to plug the, the mains connector on it, which is not live at the moment. Now we got the switch here to switch it on. Now the oscilloscope is set to probe 50x. My differential probe is set to 50x. Let me give power to the power supply and see what happens. All right, so we've got power now. And if I switch it on, there we go. We have our signal. Uh, as you can see, I have a very nice square wave. And if you look at the top right, it's at 345,000 hertz, 345 kilohertz. So that's my output of my um, switching chip, the, the controller chip. This is what I'm expecting from uh, a working power supply. Now let's check output two. There you go, that one. Give power to the power supply and the switch on. Three, two, one, go. And here we go, we have the same 345 kilohertz on output two. The amplitude of the signal is about 19 volts. And um, I can tell you that the chip itself has 19 volt as an input. So that makes totally sense. Now let's move to the bad power supply and let's see whether we have uh, a switch in output. I'm back to the bad power supply, the faulty power supply, and I've connected my probe exactly as before on pin 7, which is one of the outputs. So I've got probe connected to pin 7, the negative is on my, let's call it ground, I've got mains in, my switch is connected there, you can't see it, but it's here. Let's switch to the oscilloscope and let's see what we have. Okay, got power now and switch it on. As you can see, there is nothing. Actually, you can see something happening. But not much. Now, if I put it in roll mode, I think you can see something here. You see, there's little, there's a, there's an attempt on switching. I can put it in single mode. You can see it. There you go. Uh, you can see it's actually trying to switch, but somehow it's stopping. Okay, let's check the other output and let's see if the other output is doing exactly the same. So mains is in, everything is connected. Let's try on output two. Main switched on and let's power it on now. And as you can see, it's doing exactly the same with the difference that this is staying high rather than going low. Before kind of giving up or coming to conclusions, uh, let me try, let me check another couple of things. There are a couple of input voltages. There's a reference voltage as well. Power line input voltage, signal line input voltage, and reference voltage. So let's try and check pin number four first. Uh, if I remember right, this is gonna be 19 volts. Power on now. There we go, 19.2, which if you remember right, is the, um, the switching wave amplitude, basically. So we do have this input. 
Now, the other input is gonna be this one, BC, power line input voltage. And power. And we have the same 19 point something volts. Perfect. And finally, I'd like to check the something that says uh, there's a reference voltage. Yeah, VREF. Uh, VREF is pin number 11 here. Let's check that one. Okay, so I'm expecting 5 volts. Go mains in and on. There we go, 5.06. So this is good as well. Now, I don't want to make this video too boring. I have been through all the pins and I've been comparing the, the good one with the bad one. And the, the most important part is the, the faulty one. It, there's no switch and output. So I thought, well, maybe this, the chip is getting back some signals, some overload signals, some over voltage. And that's why it starts switching, but then it stops. But to be honest, I've been through all these pins and honestly, I can't find a different. There is this thing OVP, I guess it's an over voltage, maybe something. The bottom line is they're all the same. Everything is exactly the same. I don't see anything changing between the good one and the bad one. The bad one just doesn't output anything. So honestly, I'm tempted to just replace this chip because it, it feels faulty to me. Again, I don't, from my limited point of view, my limited experience, I don't see a feedback or something which is stopping the power supply from working. Finally, I would like to check the optocouplers. Now, what are the optocouplers? On a switch in mode power supply, you will have two sections. There's a, there's a primary section, which is this top one, and the secondary section, which is the bottom one. You see there's this white line that divides the two sections, the primary and the secondary. What's the difference? The primary section is where the mains voltage in, the dangerous voltages are, the rectified mains power, which becomes 400 volts. The secondary section is basically where you have your low voltage rails, uh, in this case, 5 volts and 12 volts. Now you can see here the same line is going through the board and is going under this transformer under these three components here, then it's going under or in between capacitor, another little transformer, which is the 5 volt transformer, and two more of these components here. Now, to keep a power supply like this safe, you don't want to have any type of electrical connection between the primary and the secondary. Reason is, you know, anything can happen and you definitely don't want to have mains voltage or even more or even higher like rectified DC 400 volts coming out of your low voltage connectors to your computer, to your PlayStation, to your mobile. In order to avoid this kind of fault, there are only a number of selected components which can be in between the two sections. Number one is transformers. Transformers, when they're properly designed, um, they really can't fail. They can open, they, they can become an open circuit. Even if the primary shorts, it doesn't pass the voltage to the secondary. It, it will burn the board, it will trick your, your breaker or your RCD, but it will not pass mains voltage to the secondary. So that's why you have two transformers here. Now, this is a capacitor, but it is an X1, Y1 rated capacitor. This is rated up to, I think it's about 5,000 or even 8,000 volts. So that's kind of designed to be across the primary and the secondary. Now, the problem is you need to have some kind of dialogue in between the secondary section and the primary section. More specifically, the switching chip needs to know how the voltage is doing to basically regulate it. So for example, when you turn on your PlayStation, there's a sudden load on the 12 volts rail and, uh, and probably the switching chip will need to increase the duty cycle of the switching that will maintain the 12 volts to 12 volts. Otherwise, I don't know, I'm just guessing the voltage may drop to 11.5, which is really not acceptable for a, for a computer. Now, how do we tell the switching IC that it's time to increase the duty cycle of the switching poles because the voltage is dropping. Again, we can't have any physical connection between primary and secondary, so we need to find another way. And this is where these components are coming to play. These are optocouplers. Um, optocouplers, as you can see, they have two legs on one side and two legs on the other one. But wait a minute, we just said we can't have an electrical connection between the two sides because it's too dangerous. Well, the reason, um, these four legs, the, the two on the left and the two on the right, they're not actually electrically connected. So how do they transfer signals one uh, side to the other? Well, with light, 
Uh, on the right hand side, these two legs are actually connected to an LED. So there's actually a light inside this component, it's amazing. The light is basically proportionate to the signal that is being fed to this side. So for example, you can design your circuit to power the LED to a proportional level to the 12 volt output. So if the 12 volt decreases, the light decreases in intensity as well. On the left hand side of the optocoupler, which is the primary side, there's a phototransistor. So the phototransistor will read the bright the LED light and will allow more or less current based on the brightness of the LED inside the uh, optocoupler. Uh, this should be for the 5 volts rails, I don't need them right now, but these three they're actually for the 12 volts. There's a label at the back, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not guessing this. Basically the first one here, the first one on top is called, it's for the regulation, so that basically is, um, is sending a feedback to the uh, switch and chip to make sure the 12 volts actually stays 12 volts all the time regardless of the load connected. The second one is the protection, is the overload or actually over voltage. So if the voltage goes over, I think on this model is about 14 volts, it will send, send a signal to the switch and um, IC and it will just stop the circuit immediately. The third one, it's quite interesting, is the on-off. As I said, this power supply will output 5 volts as soon as it's powered, but it won't power 12 volts unless pin 1 and 5 of these connectors are shorted. Now, how do you pass this signal, which as you can see, it's on the secondary side to the primary, through an optocoupler, it's the same thing. So the optocoupler will just um, pass this signal from, from the secondary to the primary. So what I'd like to do now is to check with you the output of these optocouplers the reason is, as you can see, now the third one is on and off and we know it works, to be honest, because the, the, I can hear that the circuit is trying to power up, but uh, as you notice, the regulation and the overload, they actually have the potential to stop the switching IC from working. So let's go ahead, let's check together the behavior of these three optocouplers and we'll compare it with a good one. Here is my setup. I am currently connected to the first optocoupler, that's the on-off one, so that should do something when I'm switching the unit on and off, which I'm going to do through this button. Uh, this is set to voltage, so we see that whether there's a voltage drop across that um, optotransistor, uh, which is the output of the optocoupler, and let's see what happens. I'm giving power to the power supply now. So we got 25 volts DC coming out of it, and if I switch it on, it goes to zero. If I, switch in, if I switch it off, it goes back to 25 volts. So, you know, that, that's the behavior. And I compare this with the good power supply and it's exactly the same. So let's move on to the next one, which is the over voltage protection. Mains voltage in three, two, one, go. So there's nothing with just with power, which is kind of expectable or expected. And when I power up the power supply, I have 18.9 volts out of it. I have compared with the others off camera for to keep this video as short as possible, but interesting at the same time. And uh, the other power supply is reading 19 volts exactly. So it's basically exactly the same voltage. Let's move to the third and last uh, optocoupler, which is the regulation. I'm definitely expecting a different behavior from the regulation optocoupler because again, one is sensing 12 volts and the other one is sensing zero volts. So there must be something different. So let's give it a go. I'm giving mains to in three, two, one, go. So it's now reading zero volts. And if I'm powering up, it's reading five, five volts. Now, when I tried the good power supply, when I was, uh, when I was powering up, there was uh, a reading of 0.7 volts out of the opto optocoupler. So I'm guessing it's kind of the other way around. Probably the lower the voltage uh, sensed at the output, the higher the voltage or the voltage drop at the at the optocoupler. So again, it's, it's different. Again, on the good one is 0.7 on the bad one is 5 volts and that's simply telling me that the optocoupler works. Again, I don't see 
I don't see an anomaly here, to be honest. So all my suspicions are going to the switching IC. So I guess the next step would be to source another chip, uh, which is available, surprisingly, here in the UK on eBay, uh, not too much high, pri high price. Definitely not worth for this power supply because I purchased the new one for £12 and uh, the replacement chip is like £5. But the, again, it's just for fun. I would like to see whether my speculations and investigations are correct or whether I am completely, completely mistaken here. So let's place an order for a new IC and see what happens. Finally, the spare IC has arrived. So I'm going to remove the existing one, the hopefully faulty one. Uh, I'd like to use my hot test station to remove it. And then I'll just solder it pin by pin. To remove it without burning things around, I think I'm gonna use my preheating station, just uh, warm the board to say 100 degrees more or less. Then I think I will melt, I will basically mix some uh, lead solder with the lead-free solder, which I'm expecting to find on this board. And hopefully without touching, you know, there's a little uh, trimmer around and resistors. Hopefully I can remove it without m messing the, the space around with resistors and capacitors. So let's give it a go. Okay, that worked. I'm sorry I couldn't keep the microscope on top. It's just too close to the board. I don't have angled nozzles and I still haven't received my 0.75 Barlow lens that hopefully will allow me to work a bit better with the, uh, with the hot state station or larger tools, but it worked. Next thing I wanna do, I wanna remove the solder, clean the pads. I'm not super skilled when it comes to this kind of soldering stuff. Let me solder one pad, I think is the best way. Let's do top right. Uh huh. Okay. This goes here. Let's uh, place the chip roughly where it has to be. Let's add a little bit of flux. And then the idea is, not easily, because again, I've got too many things in the way, is to align this thing. And I'm assuming that if I looked at the microscope rather than, it is not easy at all. Okay, that looks centered. It's the right orientation and it, look, it looks very centered. So I think the idea now is to do another pin. Uh, let's add a little bit of flux. Ah, no, why? Okay. Right, let me hold it down and try and melt what's there. I'm using my left hand, which shakes even more than my right hand, and I have components in the way. Oh my gosh, this is never gonna work. Okay, well, that worked. Not the best, but it worked.
Okay, not bad. It's a bit overexposed there. Unfortunately, when I'm connected via USB, I don't have control to the exposure. Shall we fix this one? So, uh, as much as they are connected, I'm not sure I like them. too much. No, oh, that's okay. And I don't think there's anything shorting or touching. Honestly, I've had this microscope for just a few weeks now and I'm wondering how did I do before without it. Okay, that's it and uh, we can test it. I think what I'd like to test before, uh, see whether we have 12 volts or not, I'll connect my oscilloscope probe to the output and see whether we have an output, um, um, a switching output. If we do, chances are we have 12 volts. If we don't, well, we won't have 12 volts. Okay, everything is connected. I've got mains voltage connected, but not live yet. I've got my differential probe connected. It's connected to one of the outputs, so we should see uh, some sort of switching frequency coming out of it. Three, two, one, go. Whoa, look at that. Look at that, we got switching frequency. Ladies and gentlemen, we have switching. Look at that, 340 kilohertz. I am absolutely amazed. I was totally not expecting this. So now, so let's discharge the capacitors. Let's plug something on the 12 volt outputs and see if this thing actually works. I'm ready to give it mains voltage. Three, two, one, go. We got mains voltage at the power supply. And now I'm ready to activate 12 volts if it works. Three, two, one, go. Yes, it works, 12 volts, look at that. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, honestly, I wasn't expecting this power supply to work. It's like I must have probably missed something on the IC and there must have been something which I didn't measure, I didn't see. No, it was actually the IC, absolutely amazing, 12 volts. I have a problem. I don't have a PlayStation FAT, well, I don't have a working PlayStation FAT to test this power supply. Now, the only thing I can do before ending this video is I've plugged in an 8 ohm resistor. This is a 100 watts 8 ohm resistor. According to uh, Ohm's law, which I, you know, I don't know by heart, I, I have an app for that. <laughs> 12 volts uh, with an 8 ohm resistor, uh, basically the resistor is going to dissipate 18 volts, uh, sorry, 18 watts. And uh, what I want to do is to plug the oscilloscope as well and see, take a look at that 12 volts, make sure it looks okay. Three, two, one, go. No, it's all good. My oscilloscope is reading 12.2 RMS, and as you can see, the actually, uh, you know, uh, the reading is very, is very clean. And I think this is the end of the video. Again, unfortunately, I, this, the, I can't really test this on a PlayStation, but I will hopefully in the future if I fix my PlayStation. But for now, all I can do, to be honest, is just uh, put the good sticker. I hope you enjoy the process as well. And uh, again, really, really feel really happy that uh, you have that positive vibe when you actually fix something, not just by uh, throwing components or something, but you actually look into things and, and you try and find out what the problem is. So this is the end of the video. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you have a great day and I hope to see you again soon on my channel.